Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there's a lot of slides here, but I'm going to fly through them pretty quickly, because many of them are just visuals. Um, but and I know you also studied this last year. If you were in an LNJ in eighth grade, you spent a decent amount of time on the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to talk about it as it impacted Europe, and then eventually, of course, came to the United States. Good stuff. Okay, so just the big ideas we're going to talk about. Uh, this is going to start in Great Britain. One of the important things you should know is why Great Britain was such a great ground for this to start in. It's mean new technology. Uh, there was a smaller system where things would be done separately in houses called the cottage system where someone would take the raw materials, work them to a place that was usable, they would take them to another place, and it was localized, or they could also put it, do the entire product, but it'd be done in small, small uh, groups and small areas. Some of the good things that come out of the Industrial Revolution are that things are cheaper. It actually increases the standard of living for most people because they can afford things they couldn't before. Think about like big screen TVs today. When the big screen TVs came out, they were a couple of thousand dollars. Now you can get a 50 inch TV for under $300. So as the technology gets better, they're more efficient at making things, goods become cheaper. Uh, population is going to go up, start because there's going to be an agricultural revolution with this as well. So starvation will be down, population will be up, and there's going to be a shift to the cities, urbanization, something that comes out of this. But there are some bad things too, uh, the overcrowded, filthy cities among them, and we'll mention some of the other problems that come with the Industrial Revolution. This is just a timeline so you can see where we are. The Industrial Revolution is considered to start around 1715 or 1750. So that would have been really before we even talked about the French Revolution. The Industrial Revolution would have already been having an impact in Europe, France included. A lot of those sans culottes were factory workers uh, who were upset with the working conditions and their pay and also the, the price of bread, if you remember. So you can see some of the other things that were going on as this happened. Some of the big ideas that came out of this, right, you have the factory system, you can see some of the political ideas such as capitalism and Marxism. The working class is a new group that develops uh, out of this. They aren't quite the middle class. Uh, they are a group that's kind of scraping to get by. Some of the bad things, pollution and environmental damage, uh, some good things like interchangeable parts which allow them to create things more cheaply and efficiently. Some of the scientific ideas, I'll let you look at them. I'm not going to read them all to you, but these are all going to have a big impact on how people live and get around and how and a lot of them you can see are power related. So the big ideas. Uh, the first one was the agricultural revolution. What happened with the agricultural revolution was there were several different ideas. And there's a video linked here that I'm going to put into Canvas that I'd like you to watch. It talks about the different advancements, such as crop rotation, new type of crop rotation, the steel plow, something called the enclosure axe, which allowed people to have bigger tracts of land as well, and the seed drill. So all of these things are going to allow them to plant more efficiently and to get more yield out of their crops. And that way, you're going to need less farmers because more less farmers are producing more food. The the actual laborers aren't needed anymore. And they leave the farms and head to the cities where they help spur the Industrial Revolution because they are that cheap labor that ends up being the factory workers. And the Industrial Revolution needed that cheap labor and it was supplied with because of the Agricultural Revolution. Also, less starvation and population goes up. You can see the, there's lots of economic growth. Um, again, not equally, but there was a lot of um, in the standard of living did improve a bit. People were able to afford things maybe they couldn't before, but there was also some miserable side effects. In the working class, uh, especially in Great Britain, as we said, this is where it's going to start. The working class had large numbers, but no political power. The voting was mostly based through property owners, and they weren't property owners. They were living and working and helping people become more wealthy while they were working in hard conditions, as you can see, 12 to 16 hours a day. Uh, their children were working too in order to be able to make a living. There weren't schools, so 
maybe at five, four or five, six or seven, you would end up doing work in a factory. If you got injured on the job, you were fired. There wasn't a you know, sick leave. There wasn't any social security. So you worked until you died. Uh, they didn't have protections. They didn't have unions to fight for them for better wages or safer working conditions either. So as I said, this started in Great Britain. There was a reason. And part of it was the fact that Great Britain was an island and sort of a smaller society. But they were always supporting innovation and technology. They had the natural resources necessary, coal, iron, and water among them. Uh, they had the cheap labor from moving from the farms to the cities. They had colonies such as the Americas or North America, which uh, enabled them to get materials like cotton. Uh, raw supplies back to Britain. They also had colonies in India and Africa and all around the world. They had a good banking system. They had they, they allowed people to invest and make money. And they had a strong navy to help protect their goods coming back and forth from overseas. Uh, just a map that shows how the Industrial Revolution is going to expand. Another more Looking at the progression of how the Industrial Revolution happened, relating it to the Protestant Reformation, the Age of Discovery, and those two ideas are going to meld into the agricultural revolution and advancements in technology and the goods that are needed. The timeline of the Industrial Revolution, as I said, it started in the 1750s in Great Britain. That's the Germany and France, mainland Europe, then the United States, and then finally Japan. You can see what was needed for an industrial revolution. You had to have those natural resources in order to be able to make the goods and equipment needed. This is just uh, where the wealth was accumulated and what was being created at this time. Population growth is going to spike. As you can see, it took all of human history for the population to reach 1 billion, which was in 1800, and then it started to balloon. You can see the second billion was added in 130 years, and then the third billion was added in just 30 years, then 15 years, uh, even cutting down from there. We're over 7 billion people at this point. Same graph. And so, this is one of the questions you're going to ask and answer in the Ed Puzzle. What, answer, pick one of these questions and answer them. What long term effects would this have on the world and civilization? Talking about the population explosion. How does the expanding population today affect our lives? What technology and new inventions helped to cause the population explosion during the Industrial Revolution? And why and how were populations kept lower during the pre industrial period? Some of those answers will be in some of the videos that have been linked uh, that are in Canvas. Others were uh, throughout this PowerPoint. You know, for the last one, you remember when serfs were on a farm, they had that permission to marry. And the reason that the farmer or the, not the farmer, the uh, property owner might not allow them to get married was because they didn't have enough supplies for everybody. They didn't have enough to support a larger population. So he would hold off on them getting married. Once the popula once the Industrial Revolution starts and people move to the city, there's no one preventing them from getting married. And the marriage age becomes much younger. And only by three years or so. It goes from twenty three to around twenty. But that's three more years of people having children. And it's gonna to lead to the another part of the population explosion. The stages of the Industrial Revolution, you can see we're going to be talking about the 1750 to 1850 part, mostly where it's Europe and starting the factory. So the factory system, much of it is based around textiles. Uh, then it goes to the United States and Japan, and that's where you start to see the rise of unions and the ideas of Karl Marx coming on. They start to end child labor and slavery. Public education becomes something that is available in more places. And you end up with uh, more professional jobs as well, and travel is going to increase with the railroad. 
stage three, it was mostly a wartime economy. The Industrial Revolution is used to gear up for World War One and World War Two. Some of the big things that come out of there, though, are the development of electricity and the internal combustion engine and the automobile. So transportation becomes much more personal and quicker rather than having to follow a train tracks. You can now kind of go on your way and when you want and where you want. Okay, so from 1950 to today, you can see some of the things that develop that are in our lives today, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, the computers, plastics, uh, China becoming more of a powerhouse and involved in this, robotics, which are still developing. And then the other question is, what's next? Do we Are we going to be forced to go to a kind of a green revolution where we are more eco-friendly, we recycle, we use more green technologies? Uh, my house, we just put on solar panels uh, to kind of make that shift to the eco-friendly. Um, we recycle here in school and most of you do at home. Some new inventions, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, just kind of comparing them to today. Take a look at the safety or lack of safety on these. Uh, there aren't any warnings or directions and no guards to make sure that people don't get hurt. And again, if they did get hurt, that was it. They, they lost a, a hand or a finger or if they couldn't do their job anymore, they were fired. The, there was no suing the factory to get your, you know, to make sure you get wages or whatever. A lot of these you'll see are in the textile industry. The flying shuttle is big. The power loom is going to start these giant textile mills. James Watt steam engine. The first steam engine actually was used to pump water out of mines so they could mine more coal. The coal was used to drive the steam engines, so they were able to create more steam engines. And then as the steam engine was developed more and more, it was put into trains and, and used to run factories as well. You can see a steam tractor, not really efficient, but it was a little bit more powerful than, you know, depending on feeding and, and using the horses. Steam ships uh, were the first really effective use of the steam engine for transportation of goods and people. Steam locomotives, as they got developed and the engines got a little bit more efficient and smaller, the locomotives are going to change everything. Uh, this is a just a, one of those pictures that makes me cringe a little bit. Look at these gears and right near this girl's hair. What if she stands up? She's going to get sucked into that machine. And it wasn't uncommon for that to happen to young girls and, and young kids. They were always put in the spots where they would have to maybe go behind the machines and clean and could get killed and, and caught in those and caught in the machinery. You can see the difference between a modern day factory, a little bit cleaner, uh, more safety more uh, robots doing the work rather than people as well. The factory system was really rigid. People had this uh, strict schedule. They would work 12 to 14 hours. A bell would send them in and a bell would send them to lunch and a bell would send them back home again. And it was usually just the same job over and over again. Uh, there was a book by Charles Dickens and it was about the workers. It's called Hard Times. And he called the people hands, the workers. He just called them hands because that's what was considered to be valuable for them. And this is a quote from there where he was trying to give the people dignity. Said anywhere side by side, the work of God and the work of man. And the former, even though it be a troop of hands of a very small account, will gain in dignity from the comparison. So Dickens oftentimes wrote about the downtrodden from the story of the excerpt we read in the French Revolution to, you may know, Oliver Twist. Uh, he was oftentimes writing about those poorer segments of society. And here he's trying to say that, you know, no matter the simplest man is still more complex and greater than the most complex machine that can be created. The idea of the factory is that you are going to put things all in the same spot. They're going to locate them near the source of power, which at this time was typically a river. You can move the labor. You can move everything out and you can now move the goods to the markets. So the power, whether it be a near a coal mine or near a river, was the most important source. And they would bring people there, they would build towns, they would actually um, you know, like I said, move all the needs of the factory to the factory. In eighteen fifty it was only ten percent of English industry, so still ninety percent was operating the way that it had before. But you can see the impact of that. There were over a million textile workers in 1850, up from 150,000 in 1813. So quite a exponential increase. 
you can see the home life of the workers wasn't great. They spent most of their life in the factories. Many generations will be crowded into a home. Look at that. Richard Arkwright is considered to be the pioneer of the factory system with his invention of the water frame and one of those inventions that allowed textiles to be done in one place in a large scale. Canals were the early form of transportation. Coal was an important resource. The impact of the railroad was very important. And I'll also put another link to this video on Canvas so you can take a look at how the railroad impacted the lives of people. And if you're interested, if you like John Green, it's one of his videos. So you can see it's going to cut the time in a quarter. It's going to take a quarter of the time to get somewhere. You can, where it would take you a whole day in the carriage to get to Liverpool, 24 hours each way. Now you can get there and back in a day. So it's going to increase business. It's going to really allow, it's going to make the world bigger or smaller. Sorry. It's going to make the world smaller so people can get to more places. Like today, we can get to, you know, where it's 24, it was six hours to get from London to Liverpool. You can get to London to Philadelphia in six and a half hours on a plane today. So we've done this even further and made the world even smaller based on times of travel. There were the haves and the have nots. The factory owners became wealthy and the workers just toiled away and just barely survived. <clears throat> there was something called the middle class, though. The middle class developed, but it was such a wide group. It could be lawyers, it could be doctors, it could be factory owners. Uh, not today, where we would think a um, somebody who worked in a factory and made a decent living would be middle class. There, the factory workers were a, a different class, a lower class. Uh, today, or here, white collared white collar jobs were more the middle class. They weren't all rich, but they had, did have. They were a big boon to the economy. They, but like I said, a factory owner who is incredibly wealthy it could be a person in the middle class, also a skilled laborer could be someone in the middle class. Uh, so. And you still had that nobility that would be the upper class. The upper class was still kind of a birthright or a, or a titled thing. So you have this upstairs, downstairs life, a lot of political cartoons. People started to notice the disparity in wealth. Obviously, not much was done about it. You still have a lot of the disparity of wealth issues today. Um, you can see there's kind of a, this was an image that you know, the people who are downstairs are more blessed, which this is a, a good image for both sides. Uh, you can see there's a sink coming down here, whereas the people upstairs would continue to, the wealthy would continue to promote that, yeah, if you are, it's noble to be poor and it helps you get into heaven because that kept their nice life and it also made these people a lot more content to live the lives they were living because that's the way things are supposed to be. And meanwhile, the, the wealthy factory owners would take advantage of that lifestyle. Again, as you can see, the working class, we've hit this a lot already. Uh, the One of the big things was that you know, they felt they felt that you could replace them. They're doing a monotonous job that was just something repetitive, and they could be easily replaced. So it didn't matter if you had, since you had this large population, it didn't matter if you had safety restraints or if you made sure people didn't get hurt. If they got hurt, you got rid of them, and you got somebody else. Everybody in the family worked. Uh, men, women, and children, usually the elderly people or the people who were disabled at work would be the ones who were taking care of the very little children until they could go off to work. Uh, the bourgeoisie was kind of the middle class here, whereas, uh, and that comes from the French Revolution. Remember, the bourgeoisie were kind of that wealthy members of the third estate, didn't have the titles, but they were still, but they were wealthy. Uh, the first Show time the Industrial Revolution was shown off was in the Crystal Palace exhibition in uh, Great Britain in 1851. And just the following slides are some pictures from that. So even though the upper class really gets criticized a lot in factory owners, there was a mutual need. Right? Without those factories, the Jobs wouldn't have existed, and what would people have done? Right. So, but the desire to continue to profit and to make more and more is going to lead to those dangerous conditions, working conditions, 
and the poor workers, poor conditions for the workers. The workers are going to try to move and try to gain a voice to be able to, to change things and have some sort of political influence. You can see wages. There was that, the red part there is kind of the sweet spot in rate wages. Uh, if you were between 22 and 46, you would be paid a bit more, uh, but then it would start to go down. You can see actually as younger females, workers got higher wages. Yeah. Uh, the reason again, typically, uh, the female work workers were able to do those jobs that they're required to do at a younger age. They're also, you know, women are typically more mature at a younger age than men as well. Uh, work and live. This is some of the living conditions. You can see how crowded it was. The awful pollution being put out. More of the working and their living conditions of the people. And as I said, child labor. It was a rampant problem. You needed, to, you needed to feed the family, so the kids went to work, and the factory owners were more than happy to barely pay them for them to do that. The mines were where where the some of the worst offenses were of the child labor. They were able to fit in the small areas where the adults weren't, and so chimney sweeps was another terrible one where they would put these kids up on a chimney, and they would sometimes get stuck and die. Uh, there's a, a video that I'll link to, it's called Child Labor in Victorian England. Tell some of the stories of these children and what they went through. This is a sketch that's gonna cause a lot of controversy in, in England. Uh, there's a study that starts to be done on child labor and the working people in the coal mines. And this was a picture that caused a lot of controversy. So why do you think that was? I'll give you a couple of choices on, on the next slide. Let me find out what the uh, real reason was. Uh, the reason they were upset, as you can see, was that the girl didn't have a shirt on. It wasn't that she was working hard. It wasn't that she was pulling a chain to a giant cart and doing incredibly hard work. It was the fact that she was doing this in this very hot and pitch dark conditions without a shirt on. So that was the worry of the, of the people, not the fact that she was being worked like an animal. Some protests and reforms are going to come out of this, some movements that still exist today to help the lower class and the workers gain some rights. One of the early ones is called the Luddites. Luddites were really just trying to preserve their way of life. They were factory or textile workers who would go in and smash the frames and the power looms to try and preserve their, their working conditions. Uh, they were called the Luddites because there was a mythical feature, a guy named Ned Ludd, who supposedly got angry at work one day and smashed his machine and just walked off the job and was never seen again. So they said that he lived in Sherwood Forest and would come out at night and destroy these machines. Uh, the Luddites were eventually, well, was outlawed and he would be hanged if you were caught disrupting any machinery. The, work, the factory owners were the ones who largely made the laws. This is where they operated. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people call the Luddite today if they are someone who doesn't use technology. It's a kind of a nerdy insult um, today. There were some some uh, protests. This one called the, that happened. It ended up in the Peterloo Massacre. A guy named Henry Hunt was coming to speak in. Oh crap! I forget the town. Um, it was a town in Britain. And anyway, he came to speak. 60,000 people came to see him. Uh, children and families came and they were having picnics and listening to Henry Hunt speak. And some of the signs that were there were about uh, universal suffrage, trying to get women's rights to, to work or to vote as well. And there was one that says, let us die like men and not be sold like slaves. Uh, this was held by women at the rally. So they were speaking about rights for the working class. And what happened was these owner factory owners, these magistrates saw this gathering and sent soldiers into it. And the soldiers went down and they cut down many people, lots of different numbers on how many people were killed, uh, somewhere between 11 and 18, 
between four and 600 wounded. Uh, but this is going to spur people to say, you know, look at how awful we're treated. And it's going to lead to the Chartism movement, which is a push for more suffrage, which is voting rights. There's also a, a video that I will link to about the Peterloo massacre as well. There was also this movement going on in the United States. The Some of the Irish immigrants that came out from the potato famine that we learned about, came. To, many of those Irish immigrants came to the United States and they were forced to do some of the worst, most dangerous and dirty labor there was. And that was working in the coal mines. Pennsylvania was a big hotbed of, of the coal mines up in areas like Tamaqua, Scranton, in that area. There was a lot of coal. And so the Irish immigrants worked there. Their working conditions were very dangerous. There were many mine collapses, uh, many people injured on the job. They were really put in almost a type of slavery. They would have to live on the, the coal mine. There are a factory or houses built by the coal mine owner. They were forced to live there. They were forced to buy things from the factory owner's store. They were charged rent. They were charged for the equipment that they used to mine the coal. And they really ended up barely making a living and oftentimes would end up in debt to that coal mine or to the coal mine owner. And they would even, when they had free time, they would go to the pub that the mine, that the mine owner owned and they would spend any little bit of money they had there. Uh, when they died, when the worker died, the whole family was thrown out and another one was, was moved in. So these uh, coal miners went on strike. It didn't work. They came back for less wages. So a small group called the Molly Maguires uh, which was named after a, a woman protester in, in Ireland. Uh, she was, her husband had died and they tried to throw her out of the mining town. Her, and the people came and rallied, rallied for her. And there was a lot of, these tactics were used there. So they were brought over. Uh, eventually they were infiltrated by a Pinkerton detective who was, were a quasi government, quasi private, uh, detective force. And they were hanged. In, uh, in Jim Thorpe, PA. This is the, the jail where they were hanged. This is just a, a modern mine. You can go up there and visit a mine today. It's, a, it's worth doing to go down in and just see how dark it was and the kind of conditions that they were working in. And the ones you'll go in will be more of the mining what it was in the 20s, 30s, 40s, not quite as primitive as they had, so it's a little bit better. Uh, this is one of the prison cells that the Molly Maguires were kept in. This is the grave of John, also known as Black Jack Kehoe, who was the leader of the Molly Maguires. Uh, his grave site is still there. There's a legend of a handprint on the wall uh, where one of the Molly Maguires said he was innocent. And there are people that think that they were framed, that they didn't do the things that they were accused of. They were accused of murdering some of the guards, uh, the security in the mining town, and of the sabotage. So he said that uh, he was going to put his hand there and the handprint would stay there forever to show his unjust execution. So the handprint is still there. Uh, they claim that they have plastered over it and painted over it and it always comes back. It's a good tourist attraction in the jail in Jim Thornton. Workers are eventually going to gain right. People are going to look and they are the majority and these protests are going to start to take hold. There is going to be, the press is going to help as well. There's a story or a report on child labor. It's called the Sadler Report that comes out. We're going to read some of those excerpts of the Sadler Report so you can see some of the conditions medically and physically that the people, the children had to suffer. The tactic of striking came up and people, the workers would refuse to work. And then the mine owner wasn't making any money or the factory owner while they were on strike. And then finally, the people decided that they needed a voice, too. So they joined together in unions where they could have collective power to make decisions and negotiate with their, their bosses. These were originally illegal, and many of the early union leaders were targeted and, and killed and something called blackballed, where they would put be put on a list and they'd be fired from their jobs. And every other owner would know, don't hire these people because they're going to try to get the workers more money and try and make things safer for the workers. So those early union leaders really fought hard and risked a lot to improve working conditions for the, the working class. There were some new ideas out there. Thomas Malthus, I'm not going to spend too much time because you already did a short assignment on him and watched the, the video on him, uh, but kind of a morbid uh, 
a thought process that you know, the reason we are we're going to all die because the poor are having too many children and we need these tragedies to control the population, whether they be war or disease or famine. The Industrial Revolution had, like I said, had good things and bad things. Um, you can see the Industrial Revolution began a very short time ago, but has destroyed a lot of the world's resources. Another idea was David Ricardo. He had an idea called the Law of Iron Wages. He thought that when you pay people too much, they have too many children. So you have these more children, and they create a labor surplus, but then the wages go down. Uh, so if you have more children, your wages are going to go down. Another just an idea about population control. Utilitarians had the idea that the goal of society is the greatest good for the greatest number. So that the government should play a role in having that so social safety net so people have at least a minimum standard of living. And that's the idea of the utilitarians. Uh, there is some danger with that idea that you know, what's good for the greatest number, what about the people that aren't in the greatest number? What about the people that are in the minority? There is a, a worry that if, with this thinking, if it goes too far, you would be shutting out people in minority religions, minority races, whatever it might be. They Those people, minority in the ideas that they have, those people may end up uh, being you know, persecuted. Socialism and came out of this from a guy named Karl Marx. Uh, the idea was that people as a society would own the means of production, not an individual. Uh, the goal of Marxism was to benefit everyone, not just the, the rich people who owned everything, that all people should benefit and all people should have a certain standard of living. The idea was to build these perfect communities, uh, utopias. And the community aspect, that's where communism comes from. Socialism and communism, as they started, were pretty very similar ideas. As they happened in practice, not so much. Socialism can be in kind of degrees, and you can have social programs, but uh, communism is pretty much a government control of of the means of production of everything. So it's not not the way it started, but that's the way it ended up working. Uh, socialism, like I said, there's many degrees of socialism. So some things that happened to respond to the horrible treatments of the Industrial Revolution. Slavery gets abolished in the colonies in 1832. Notice that it still went on in America until 1865. The Sadler Commission is going to look into working conditions, and there are going to be some acts that help with child labor. There are going to create some poor houses, and there's going to be increased vote for people in a Reform Bill of 1832. Not much of increased voting. We're talking about Great Britain here, by the way. Um, you can see all the electoral forms, even up to 1884. The first real big reform, still only 14% of the people are going to be eligible to vote. So labor is going to start to have more of an influence, though. Uh, there's a guy named Keel Hardy who's going to actually be the first labor candidate, and he's going to be able to win an election in the House of Commons by joining together with the working people and having them contribute to his, his ability to run and work there. So uh, he's going to be a big factor in unions becoming more influential. Uh, they were a bit controversial because they were worried about unions being involved in politics and the, and the people who are always in control now didn't necessarily have that control. Some people thought that unions were more of a, a socialist kind of idea because you were giving people equal wages uh, and giving them more, making sure that they had more of the, the profits. Uh, they're going to gain power by using that, this collective power that they had to sometimes use strikes, but using negotiations as a group to be able to improve working con conditions. Uh, that was the number one goal was to not be getting, not getting killed at work and then to have a wage where you could survive and not starve and to get rid of child labor to you know, this movement as they eliminate child labor that's going to lead to public education and the education of a, of a society. So there's going to be a lot of good outcomes of the union movement. To fly through this, I can just see where industrialization happened. 
it's going to expand into the United States because of the large amount of natural resources we had, large amount of land, uh, cheap labor, and coming in from Italy. Uh, also, a lot of German immigrants are going to come in uh, leading up to World War One and after World War One. Lots of railroads. You can see how they express the railroads in 1850 are blue. Added by 1880 are red. You can see the entire continent is now spanned by railroads in Europe. Uh, there were some things that uh, they noticed a bigger need for government. You needed to have the railroads to be consistent. So the state ownership of railroads happened where you'd have this common gauge of the railroads, common uh, split between the rails. Otherwise, you would start going on the railroad and then you'd get to a different area and suddenly you couldn't go any further because you're train didn't match up with the the length of the rails so or the width of the rails so those were standardized they also needed banking to be able to get people that innovation and be able to get them to start factories so you had a started to have some national banks they also required companies to register with the government and publish annual budgets for taxation purposes and also uh, to make that money available or that those information available when negotiations happen with the unions. And there was, uh, they did these uh, things for the factories as well, uh, establish limited liability and create rules for the formations of corporations. This is to separate your corporate wealth from your personal wealth so that if something happens where a factory goes bankrupt, it wouldn't necessarily bankrupt the person. They might lose their factory, but they wouldn't necessarily lose their home. Uh, and they also created a postal system that enabled us to also work more efficiently. Let's see how life was changed. We hit a lot of this, but I just want to go through and let you see some of the visuals of this. Again, urbanization was huge out of this. People started to move to the cities because that's where the jobs were. You can see in 1750, 65% of the population was in agriculture. In 1851, it's only 25% population. Today, we're down to about 2 or 3% of the population is in agriculture. And the cities weren't ready for this. Sanitation is going to be non-existent. Uh, sewer systems that had once worked under the Romans are going to be completely overwhelmed and, and not doing what they needed to do. Working class had very poor conditions. There wasn't police protection. There wasn't any multiple education. Cholera is going to become run rampant, which is, comes from polluted drinking water uh, because of the lack of a proper sewage system. Conditions, we talked about this already. And the, one of the key points there, though, is that you know, when you had farming, farmers work really hard, but you do have breaks in the seasons and you have times of the year that are less hard. Factory work was the same thing over and over every day of the year, nonstop. Uh, you have, this is a picture of people who were injured on the job, factory workers, one of those protests, and a lot of them missing legs, this guy in front missing both his legs. Um, and there was, they were just fired. They were put out on the street. There was no social security. There was nothing to help them um, live their lives. And child labor was rampant. You had this uh, class tensions grow, and you started to hear about the disparity of wealth. Uh, that most all of us all new wealth is owned by is taken by the factory owners. Okay, so middle class, as we said, had some of the nice things. Consists so comparison between capitalism and socialism. Some of the good things, uh, good things of capitalism are that people can you know. Make them make something out of themselves uh, from nothing to, to incredibly wealthy, and you can be as wealthy as you can make happen. Under socialism, there is that basic floor where there is a, a spot in society where you shouldn't fall below, and the government should make sure that that happens, that you don't live in absolute poverty. Uh, the capitalism against free market system, socialism markets are more controlled, and there is more government intervention uh, they both have problems right in capitalism 
and in their extreme form, they both have problems. Capitalism leads to the abuse of the working class. It leads to environmental disasters. There is a huge disparity of wealth. And socialism, you kind of lose the incentive to, to work hard and that incentive to get ahead if you feel that you can't because of, you know, if everybody's going to have the same as me, why should I bother working hard? And, and these are the extreme of both of these. Um, our, our government today has, a, has bits of both of these where you still have that incentive to work hard and you have a, a somewhat of a social safety net, but there's also a huge disparity of wealth. There are three people in this country who own as, have as much wealth as the bottom 50%. Some quotes from about capitalism and socialism. The problems of these the industrial revolution still exist today, as I've been mentioning. These are some of them. We're going to finish up with some of the problems that are still around today. Child labor still exists in many countries around the world. You'll see a lot of it in Asian countries and African countries uh, where there are high rates of poverty. And a lot of it is uh, really rural. Uh, this one you can see a child still working in the factory, but a lot of times it's in the farm labor, it's in mining, um, but you still see it in the textile industry. Unsafe working conditions. This is a, a uh, factory that collapsed, a textile factory collapsed in an a, that collapsed in Asia a couple years ago, killed hundreds of people. Uh, there, the technologies that we have today, the iPhone uh, factories, the, there's a place called Foxconn that makes parts for that. And they had a, such a rampant amount of suicides because people were basically forced to work there and live there and worked incredibly hard that they put up these nets to stop people from jumping out of windows and killing themselves. And pollution still exists. Uh, and in some places, there are no restrictions whatsoever on what you can dump into the water and what you can spill into the air. And, and climate change is happening because of that. Water is becoming more polluted. There are many areas where it's unsafe to drink the drinking water and uh, polluting and the fish and all those things as well, the food sources. Disparity of wealth is another one I mentioned. And in the world, 26, 26 richest people have as much wealth as the poorest 50% of humanity. So, and I'll link a video to that as well and the sources for this on the Industrial Revolution page. 